<laughs> so he's the executive director of QBO Innovation Hub. Mr. Fajardo brings a vital perspective from the startup and innovation ecosystem. His experience in nurturing tech entrepreneurs and fostering a culture of innovation will help us understand how grassroots technological advancements can contribute to our digital public infrastructure. So as we engage in these discussions, I encourage us to think boldly about the future we want to create. How can these digital innovation service springboard for inclusive growth? How do we ensure that as we advance technolo technologically, we leave no one behind? These are very big words that we keep saying, but what exactly does that mean? Let's approach this session with open minds, critical thinking, and a shared commitment to harnessing these digital technologies for the greater good of our nation and its people because we know technology is neither good or bad. It's how we use it that matters. So just some uh, man time management. Then Mr. Shetty will be given 20 minutes, and we ask uh, him and the other speakers to, to see what Lucy will be showing later, or oh, five minutes, 10 minutes, you know. So Lucy is in charge of time management, so she'll remind Mr. Shetty that he has 20 minutes in all. Our, each of our discussants res in, uh, responses will be for about 15 minutes. And then we will have open discussions for about 20 minutes or so, then some Q&A uh, with the audience. So perhaps you can offer your questions, but we, I can also ask questions to you if you want. <laughs> you know, if you can m perhaps make it more, we would like to make it more engaging. So anyways, let me uh, now invite Mr. Shetty for his main presentation. Thank you so much, and it's it's truly an honor to be here with all of you today and along with uh, Deputy Governor from the BSP and, and Jay. The focus of my presentation is in two parts. Uh, in the first part, I'll quickly give you an overview of the digital public infrastructure we've been building in India, and primarily its impact on the banking and broader financial system. And in the second part, which is where I'll spend more of my time, uh, I'll talk to you about a concept known, by the fin known as the Finternet, which is a newer imagination of how do we give individuals and small businesses agency over all their financial assets, whether that's money, securities, uh, physical property, digital assets. And it was part of a paper that was published recently by Augustin Carstens from the Bank for International Settlements and Nanda Nilikani as well. So diving straight in, um, if, let me just see if this works. Yeah? Okay, I have to, okay. It's, it, it is actually working. I have to press a down arrow. So a bit about the story. If you go back 2008, uh, at that point in time, India was primarily not a digital economy. Uh, a large part of our population did not have any form of identity and a large part of the 1.3 billion people were completely unbanked. And so as we looked at this problem, and key to any economic development is obviously financial inclusion, we had a range of options available to us. One, you know, one of often the biggest friction points in opening bank accounts was KYC. It had a high transaction cost. It costed, you know, at that point about $20, which made it unprofitable for the banking system to go out and acquire these hundreds of millions of individuals. Uh, and so rather than diluting those norms, uh, what we instead did is worked out a mechanism called Aadhaar. Aadhaar is basically a digital ID that's given now to 1.4 billion Indians. It's a very simple construct. It just gives you back a digital attestation of who you are. So it contains your name, year of birth, gender, address, and biometrics and just gives you back a digital attestation so that you can then prove who you are to any company in India. And therefore, in a digital way, you're able to authenticate and prove your identity. This is what was used by the banking system. And if you see uh, the growth rate when we started off, uh, this is from a BIS study. It showed that if you didn't have digital infrastructure, it would have taken us traditionally 46 years to get to in bank account coverage, but we achieved that in less than a decade, in approximately nine years. So we shaved off almost four decades of what would have otherwise been developmental growth 
because as, as you even shared, we repurposed technology, designed it in a way that empowered individuals with access to their own identity, and then created infrastructure that the banking system could then use for KYC, but then our telecom sector used that, and hundreds of millions of Indians got access to 4G services. Our capital markets used that, and now you have a lot more retail investors participating. For the first time, it has flipped. We have far more retail investors than FDI as well, uh, which has a structural impact. Um, and so therefore, that was really possible because of political will, uh, and the programs launched by the government, uh, real proactiveness played by the central bank, but also foundational technology, digital public infrastructure that was built out to support this initiative. Now, Aadhaar was the starting point, uh, and as I mentioned to you, that was used both by the banking system, telecom system, so across different sectors. Uh, but the next step was, when you think about identity, identity is not just who you are. There are many other aspects to it. Where did you study? What are the other types of life events that have happened? What are the other types of certificates and you know licenses and authorizations that you have? It's sort of a large cloud. And today, it's very difficult. Let's say you pass out from a college. <clears throat> how do you prove that indeed you passed out from this college? Or if you've got an admission, how do you prove you've got an admission so that someone digitally could give you a grant. It's extremely difficult because it relies on paperwork. And so the next step was to broaden the construct of identity and create a system where individuals were empowered with any type of attestation, government certificates, mark sheets, driver's licenses. And so today in DigiLocker, which is a wallet that over uh, 200 million people use, they actually have access to a whole range of these documents in a digitally verifiable manner. And since now people had an ID, they had a bank account, the next step that came up was how do you create a way for people to transact with each other in a low cost manner? The traditional system of the card networks was extremely expensive. And when we thought about financial inclusion, which is not just about giving access to bank accounts, but it's much broader than that in terms of access to credit, access to insurance, access to other types of formal financial services, the underlying transaction costs has a huge implication on those delivery of services. And so that's when we created UPI. UPI is a simple protocol that allows you to transfer value from one store to any other. This first got implemented within the banking system for INR and from one bank account to another. But uh, the way to think about UPI is it's a very simple three-layer cake. You have settlement infrastructure at the base, regulated entities in the middle, and then all your third-party fintechs on top. And since 2016, when it launched, today UPI is about 500 million individuals using it. Uh, every day it does 500 million transactions. Uh, last year we crossed over $2 trillion of uh, value that passed through this system. And another thing that leapfrogged was merchant adoption. We went from uh, about three, four million small merchants having those point of sale hardware devices in 2016 to 50 million merchants now having QR codes and actively participating and becoming much more a part of the formal economy. So as we built this infrastructure, we realized that people were now generating data at an exponential pace. And so the next step was, how do you think about a framework that gives people control of their data? And that's where the central bank, along with uh, the other financial sector regulators, our capital markets regulator, insurance regulator, and so on, created an interoperable system known as account aggregators uh, with which you can get access to your data, give consent, and share that for lending and wealth advisory and many other purposes in a safe, secure manner. And so therefore, what is happening out here is a shift from really the lending today happening on the back of physical capital, physical collateral, which is very limited, available to a small part of the population, to lending happening on the back of digital capital, your underlying transactional flows, which is extremely powerful. And so today, over 2 billion accounts are part of this system. It's one of the largest open finance rollouts across the world. And, and then numerous private sector companies have been built on top of this digital public infrastructure. So hundreds of billions of dollars of economic value has been created because of new startups, new private entrants, 
or existing incumbents building new lines of business on top of this underlying infrastructure. Because what we realized was India was just so diverse, so heterogeneous, and of course with a large population, there was no one company and no one government agency that could solve any of these problems on its own. And so you really needed to bring all of society together and give each agency a tool that they could then use to participate in this digital economy. And so as we've been on this journey for a decade and a half, what we realized was, and while all of this sounds great, genuine constraints. Genuine constraints in the adoption of technology by the financial system. You know, I've personally been working on the data sharing framework for five years now. And I often ask myself, this stuff should take five minutes because you're sharing data from a database, to put it simplistically. But it takes five years. And it's just because the way the banking system has absorbed technology, a lot of the legacy, that even after so much push, regulatory interventions, political will, it's still quite hard. And then how do you bring this technology to other sectors, like let's say property? Today we have a lot of small land holding farmers and individuals. They don't have a way to transact digitally. And those institutions are very local bodies that can't absorb a lot of the complex technology that a bank could. And then cross-border. What we learned when we were linking our systems cross-border, Indians receive one of the largest amounts of remittances. Again, that took about five years, three to five years on average. And why should it? If two countries agree to connect to each other, they agree to their exchange rate norms and KYC norms, why does it take so long? And so a lot of that thinking then drove the imagination behind what we're now calling the Finternet. And the real idea is the financial system has solved extremely well high value, low volume transactions, right? So SWIFT, for example, which works cross-border, does $4 trillion a day, which is phenomenal. Uh, UPI, like I said, did $2 trillion last year. So in terms of value, it's nowhere there. But fundamentally, a lot of the efforts, even in Philippines, open finance across the world, open banking, all of those have been extremely good in pushing the boundary, pushing the frontier towards how the financial system uses technology. But the needs of individuals are much higher. Their aspirations are increasing even more. And when we did a conservative estimate, you know, imagine you had to bring this type of technology to different types of assets, different types of industries, and also interconnect them uh, which today become complex bilateral exercises. This is going to take a few centuries, far beyond any of our lifetimes. And that's when we started to ask, is there a newer way we could actually look at this and how uh, we are you know, incorporating technology uh, in a manner where we don't have to, every time we create a new car, we don't have to build a new road. That's basically what the financial system does today. Every time you have a new car, we literally build a new road with new rules, regulations, technologies, vendors, and that's what increases the underlying transaction costs because these roads don't talk to each other. Then you will have policies to make them talk to each other, but then it's expensive to implement. And that's what introduces a lot of the friction within the current system. And what we realized was we are at a very important threshold in society today because we are seeing a convergence. And some of you may be familiar with the, you know, sort of the wild west of the crypto uh, currencies, crypto technology that exists, and different people may have different views. But what we did is if we separate out the noise from what is happening in that sector and speculation and so on, but look at the underlying technical developments that are taking place around verifiability and interoperability and settlements, it offers very interesting answers for this point I made on convergence. If you go back in time, early days of the internet, everyone had their own internet. Uh, you know, IBM would build its own email server, email client, front end, back end, network, hardware, software, and you would just use that. And they would say, of course, we can never use the public internet because what about security and privacy, right? But then society's needs to transact and for us to talk to each other became so great that technologists created new kinds of protocols like WWW, HTTP, et cetera, that allowed us to bridge into a more interoperable whole while allowing you to place your own rules, security norms, privacy norms on top. We saw the same with smartphones. Previously, you know, you would have a camera, you would have a mic. Those aren't programmable. They don't talk to each other. 
again. Then they got unified into a smartphone, and then the smartphone unlocked a lot more value on top of it. And that's really what we are seeing within the financial system today. So the core idea behind the Fintonet is one, how do we give individuals complete agency over all their financial assets? Two, how do we do it in a manner that is unified for the individual? Uh, and so it comes together for the individual. They can bring their diverse assets together rather than having to go to multiple branches, digital portals, so on and so forth. And to do that, and do that in a way that we can positively affect 8 billion people, 300 million businesses, the underlying infrastructure has to be universal. It has to be open. It should allow for different types of developers to come in. Today, the underlying infrastructure is highly siloed. And so a key part of the FinTinet, uh, as I mentioned to you, is really the idea of incorporating a lot of the cryptographic advances. And one of the key elements of that is the idea of tokenization, tokens more generally. Now, the reason in this slide I call it back to the future is because this is what you had in the paper world when you think of cash. Uh, you had anonymity. You could transfer it to someone anywhere in the world. It would be instantly settled. But what happened is when we digitized those systems, and when we digitized, you had certain risks that came up with the intermediaries that participated in that digitization, like settlement agencies and so on. And therefore, we created a lot of scaffolding to manage those risks. Now, for the first time, with a lot of the trust moving towards the underlying technology in terms of settlement trust and you know how do you trust this piece of data as authentic or not, it really allows us to reimagine uh, this overarching playground. And so tokens are basically self-describing, self-contained packets, and you could represent any type of asset within the construct of a token. So within the FinTinet, we look at regulated assets like money, publicly listed securities, registered assets like land, uh, your physical car, other types of physical property, uh, attested assets like jewelry that might be attested by a third party verifier or like carbon credits that might be attested by a third party energy auditor or user controlled assets as well, content you, you and I create on the internet. And so the fundamental idea is if we can give people agency and you can unlock transactability of these asset, assets within appropriate rules and regulations, how money is treated will be different from how securities are treated and so on. You can allow people to participate in the economy and also protect themselves from downsides that may take place through, again, access to a whole range of financial services. So here's a very quick overview of the architecture of the FinTinet. Core to this is really giving individuals, uh, putting them in the center and designing this around that. Second is they should have the ability to access a whole range of applications. Think of it a bit like your smartphone today. Uh, and the applications are certified, but they're not regulated in that sense. Uh, you have existing financial institutions. This could be a central bank, commercial bank. But it doesn't only have to be financial institutions. It could be a private company that's issuing shares, other types of asset managers. These are what we call token managers. And they are responsible for the governance of their corresponding token. So if a bank is tokenizing money, like a, a deposit that you hold with it, then the bank is responsible for regulating the flow around the capital control norms, KYC norms, counterparty norms, sanction norms, so on and so forth. And each of these entities now issue those tokenized representations onto a ledger of the individual's choice. And so now in your ledger, you have access to different types of assets, which otherwise in the current world would be fragmented across these individual systems, whether it's money like deposits, carbon credits, equity shares, real estate, so on and so forth. And you can have third-party agencies, these are what we call value-added service providers, plugging in to add additional trust to transactions, whether that is notaries, guarantors, escrow providers, et cetera. And all of this happening on top of the existing laws and regulations, our view is a lot of that will be leveraged for the FinTinet. But of course, jurisdictions may come up with their own specific norms as well to govern these ecosystems. And here's a very simple example. And I, I took an example outside of the financial system 
uh, of carbon credits and sustainability related financing, which we know today the carbon markets are highly broken because high cost of establishing trust, repeated need of verifications, as a result of which what happens? What happens is you have small companies that have to do all of this full stack, you know, capture supply, capture demand, do the verification, create the audits. Doesn't really scale and doesn't scale globally, doesn't scale cross borders. But within the Finternet, a user through any ledger and through any set of applications, let's say they're setting up a solar roof. At that point in time, they can receive digital attestations from the manufacturer or the distributor. They can get that audited seamlessly by another third party energy auditor. And using this packet of verifiable credentials, now share that with different other service providers, whether that's access green financing, if a government has a subsidy program to prove their eligibility and access subsidies, whether that's to get access to tax credits or share it on private markets as part of carbon credits, so on and so forth. So that's really one example, but now you can layer different types of use cases on top of this. Uh, a few other aspects to the Finternet that I'll quickly cover. It does help a lot in dispute resolution because you now have underlying verifiable evidence, which you can then reproduce for mediation, arbitration, and other types of dispute resolution use cases versus spending it for decades in, in, in courts. And the way we look at this is, while the underlying technology is open and universal, uh, the governance frameworks become extremely important. And depending on the type of flow, if money is flowing, you'll have your monetary rules that apply. If securities are flowing, capital markets rules would apply. So you can now actually move towards governance based on the activity, based on the flow, rather than just governing the entities in and of itself. And then you have all of us as individuals, but also legal persons. The Finternet does look a lot at how do you allow for legal persons, MSME, small businesses, who often get left out, left out in a lot of these digital transformations on board. And so the thinking behind the Finternet is one that, you know, right from start, we've really been thinking through how does security and privacy fit into the system? How does it enhance regulation and supervisory capacity by allowing for programmatic enforcement of rules? Observability, today one of the biggest challenges for supervisors is often they observe copies of the truth, not the truth itself. And uh, how do you embed governance at all levels? We are now, since the paper got published by Augustin Carstens and Nanda Nilikeni, uh, we are now uh, uh, putting together an open source community across the world to think through the underlying technical aspects behind the Finternet and setting up a set of technical labs in different countries to drive adoption pilots as well as work out what are the early protocols and standards and interoperability related uh, 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 technical uh, design considerations that have to be made. But while the Finternet is an ambitious vision, uh, we see this playing out over the next 10 years. And so really it's about thinking through what is the next plus one that each of us can do as private sector, as public authorities, to bridge ourselves into this new world and calibrate that. So while it's an ambitious vision, how do each of us calibrate our action so that we don't lose trust, we don't lose confidence, you don't move fast and suddenly things blow up, which you can do in the traditional world of technology, but within the financial system, that's not the most uh, best way of moving fast and breaking things. So that's really a quick overview of uh, DPI, Finternet, and happy to take any questions later. Thank you so much. Well, thank you very much, Mr. Shetty, for providing us that very informative presentation. Uh, now may, may I invite uh, the Deputy Governor to provide his initial response. Check, test. Yes. Um, actually, I've seen the initial version of uh, CDAR's presentation about uh, a year ago. Uh, oh, no, earlier, earlier this year. Yes, and it's very uh, exciting. The whole BIS, Bank for International Settlements, uh, it's an um, like associ association of central banks all over the world, um, are excited about. Um, in fact, they have started uh, initiating uh, experiment, not only experimentation, but also actual work on it by organizing central banks and also uh, private commercial banks to work together to have at least the uh, payment side of things 
uh, sorted out and, and uh, I reckon um, brought to the market. So um, we are watching this uh, project by uh, CDARTH and uh, with the BIS very closely. And in fact, we have um, indicated our interest to be an observer uh, in that uh, project because it, pro it, it's a huge step towards the realization of, of uh, the vision by combining both central bank money and uh, commercial bank money uh, either in as a form of like uh, exchange of value settlement or as a form of uh, settling or yeah settling uh, assets uh, like probably government securities, corporate bonds, uh, equities market. So um, we uh, uh, we share uh, the desire for this uh, vision to come into fruition. And so we are doing also, uh, Sidar said, uh, everyone's looking for the plus one. Next step. So we're also uh, doing our own way to contribute towards this by um, perhaps initiating our own uh, CBDC um, uh, project. So, uh, and that's what I would like to do, do I proceed with the presentation? Yeah. Or uh, Jay, you want to say yeah. something? So uh, proceeding with my presentation, I'd just like to thank uh, Dr. Albert for the invitation to be with you all here. It's a pleasure to present and share the Banco Central ng Pilipinas CBDC uh, journey thus far. Um, let me start down. There you go. Thank you. So let me start by sharing that the central bank digital currency or CBDC is a form of digital money denominated in the national unit of account and is a direct liability of the central bank. So in a way, uh, that def except for the digital money, uh, in a way you can think of it as like cash, right? Um, denominated in peso, national unit of account, and the direct liability of the central bank. So you see, uh, it's, it's uh, risk-free, uh, fully assured by the state, and therefore um, s uh, stable and, and uh, highly reliable. There are two types of CBDC, namely wholesale and retail CBDCs. The former is a type that institutions can maintain in an account with the central bank, similar to reserve accounts, while the latter is the form that the general public can own and have access to. In other words, uh, in, the, in the wholesale uh, payment space, these are uh, payments among two financial institutions um, whose settlement is time-bound, meaning very critical, and it has to happen very quickly. Um, and, and uh, of course, second is that uh, uh, it, it can also be used, uh, meaning wholesale payments can be used to settle financial market in, uh, in, uh, transactions, like again, um, settlement of uh, wh when people exchange foreign currencies, when people exchange, uh, let's say, peso dollar, or when people buy or corporates buy uh, bonds, government securities, and equities. So um, they have to be settled for transfer ownership to, to transfer. So um, th that's, that's wholesale payment. As against retail uh, payments or retail CBDC, that is used primarily by the end users like us, individuals, corporates, uh, even government. But um, the, the nature of the payment is not um, similar to the wholesale, wholesale payments, meaning uh, they could be settle, settled uh, a little bit later, so it's not time-bound. The amounts are usually smaller, and these are between two individuals or a, a corporate and a a, ju a juridical entity or a, or a natural person and, and, and so on, or even government. So um, in, in 2020, the BSP started assessing and looking into this uh, exciting uh, innovation on distributed ledger technology. And this was already when, you know, crypto, uh, so-called cryptocurrencies, which of course we call virtual assets, 
uh, because they're to us they're not currencies. Um, I started coming out and, and you know becoming better known by the public, and uh, from there the reading the literature and the reports coming from the central banks who went ahead with ex exploring and experimenting on CBDC reported. And these are like cost savings and payments efficiency, uh, payment system safety and resilience, uh, promoting financial inclusion, and um, also enhancing monetary policy transmission on top of, of course, uh, maintaining um, monet the central bank's monetary sovereignty. Um, so that was in 2020. And uh, moving on to 2021, um, we started to have a more detailed assessment of uh, where do we use uh, CBDC. So we assessed the potential impact of the technology, the distributed ledger technology, against um, the gaps that we have in our payment systems, both wholesale and retail. And uh, it was exciting to note that for, for the wholesale payment system, we saw that uh, the the um, settlement of, of CBDC, which can be instantaneous or almost instantaneous, is because it's like, just like, you know, if I pay you cash, th that doesn't have to be cleared, right? I mean, immediately I transfer the value to you. Uh, so s very strong in settlement, very strong in um, liquidity and default management because you can get immediate access to funds that, that uh, you may need. Um, and also securities, uh, oh sorry, and also the programmability. It's uh, programmability and efficiency because you can, um, in, 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 the, in the blockchain, you can specify the conditions for the transfer of uh, value. So, um, but, but the same is not true on the retail payment side because on the retail payment side, we see that what, what we have now, which is, which is our digital payments, is already achieving what, what you know, it was designed uh, to achieve. In fact, we ended the year 2023 with 52.8% of our total retail payments transaction vo volume being done digitally. And it is growing very uh, steeply. And so we decided to focus on uh, wholesale CBDC create a project, which we call Project Aguila, and uh, uh, assess, uh, experiment, and, and see if we can apply this innovation to, uh, number one, cross-border payment, very important to a country like the Philippines, fourth largest inward uh, remittance receiving country in the world, total aggregate amount of about 9% of our GDP, so very uh, important part of financing our development. Um, Cross-border payments. The other one is uh, security settlement because you look at the capital markets in the region, we were, I hope C. Darth is not hearing this, but <laughs> we, we, we have one of the stunted uh, capital markets uh, in the world, dwarfed by our, even in our uh, ASEAN 5 uh, neighbors. And also, uh, the third is um, liquidity and uh, liquidity management. So um, what if on a, on a weekend you need to take out a huge shipment from the port, but uh, the checks and PesaNet only opens on Monday? But we think that with the CBDC, you can have, you know, you can immediately settle for all your fees and then um, have your bank, have your bank settle all the fees, and then you just take your critical shipment uh, out. So those are the potential um, um, areas that we looked into. And so we decided on two phases. Uh, we broke down Project Agile into two phases. One is the system selection, where we decided, by the way, this project, we involve uh, six participating uh, financial institutions. We invited everyone, and then these six uh, made it to the deadline to participate in this uh, proof of concept project. And then, of course, there are other observing uh, observers uh, institutions. And so the first system selection, we decided to, to, I mean ourselves, plus the participants, decided to go with the Hyperledger Fabric uh, distributed ledger technology. Uh, and then, so we now said, okay, um, we passed the gate for phase one. 
we move to phase two where we would actually like to already uh, experiment and use the system in an actual live, uh, well, uh, live as a test, not, not live available to the, to the public. Uh, in order for the BSP to get an assurance that we can issue it and uh, go through the currency life cycle safely and efficiently. Because sometimes with all these excitements in new technology, you have to separate the hype from the reality. So I, there, there's one way to do that. You don't read that in reports. You have to try it out. You get your, have to get your hands dirty and your feet wet. So we, we did that. And uh, we went through the whole cycle of uh, minting, issuing, distributing, uh, redeeming, and retiring uh, these CBDCs. And uh, uh, I'll share the results later. So, uh, and the other gap that we have is um, if, if uh, the knowledge within BSP is um, uh, not at the level that can make you feel confident about using this payment, new payment instrument, it's equally the same for the banks. Because uh, most likely they just know what we know. So we said that, okay, let's, let's experiment together. Let, let's use it amongst ourselves so that you would also know uh, how, to, you know, how to use it, how to settle your transactions through it, and how to keep it safe, how to, where to put controls, and of course to educate your, your employees on, on how this uh, uh, innovation works. So um, we did that proof of concept. We began that in uh, uh, 2022, and we're now, uh, well, we've just completed cycle two of our proof of concept uh, testing. And so, well, this was what I mentioned earlier, when we went through all the cycle of uh, the currency life cycle. And uh, us, together with the, with the financial, participating financial institutions, have gained that confidence on, on how we can uh, use this and manage this safely. And so, um, um, right now, we're discussing whether um, whether it's there is enough uh, business case to launch it in the market, or we still need to build up uh, on on um, the use cases so that it it could really make an impactful entry uh, into the market. So uh, that one is still up in the air because we just finished the the proof of concept test cycles, and we still need to. Uh, discuss and, and assess whether do we have an MVP, a minimum viable product, or should we extend our experimentation to cover, let's say, security settlement so that we have a, a, a you know, um, very good basis to deliver it, provide it in the, in the market. So uh, hope our objective here is hopefully once we make, let's say, a security settlement very efficient, while maintaining its uh, safety, of course, um, we we would like to push the benefits down to to the public. So um, personally, I, I dream of the days when uh, Mang Pandoy, you know, uh, his uh, representation of our very poor, uh, low-income uh, Filipino would be able to, say, invest, uh, I don't know, 500, 1,000 in a government security and enjoy the 6% uh, interest rate as compared to 0.025% you get in, a, you know, in your usual traditional savings account. Uh, or even buy equities in Ayala land or uh, buy corporate bonds in SM investment. Oh, uh, you know, it, it could be um, any of those. So... Uh, in, in, in closing, I just want to express my heartfelt gratitude for inviting me to present in this learning session. The journey towards the future of currency through CBDC is one that demands collective effort and collaboration. I just want to make a clarification. We intend to, we are scheduled to end our Project Aguila in January of 2025. And we're going to put out not only the assessment, but also a CBDC roadmap. But Project Aguila's objective is not yet 
to put out or to issue wholesale CBDC. No, it's just, it's more of a learning journey to get everyone up to speed with the technology, get everyone confident that we can use this, manage this, govern this uh, responsibly, and uh, also um, have some, some um, um, transactions or use cases in mind where we can really leverage the strength of this uh, new payments uh, instrument. Um, the insights gained from the ongoing uh, sandbox phase, as mentioned earlier, will guide the creation of a tailored CBDC roadmap, ensuring that our digital financial landscape aligns seamlessly with the unique needs of our nation. As we move forward, I invite you all to stay engaged in shaping the future of CBDC in the Philippines. The BSP remains committed to embracing technology to foster payments innovation as we strive to create a stronger, more resilient and digitally empowered economy. Thank you very much. Well, thank you, uh, Mr. Deputy Governor. That was, again, uh, very insightful because, uh, you know, many of us may not even know, well, we might have heard a little bit about the CBDCs, but now we're, we're getting more details from, from the main uh, person who's pushing, pushing this uh, through the BSB itself, uh, all the details about the results of the regulatory sandbox and the, case, the, the proof of case. Uh, and now, uh, we, may I now call on um, uh, Mr. Fajardo to give his uh, discussions. All right, uh, thanks so much. Thanks for inviting me. I'd like to uh, definitely reinforce the, the, the initiatives by the Central Bank, um, something that we, we surely need. And uh, perhaps I'd like to, I can start with a uh, experience I had last night. Um, doing my own digital payment uh, experience journey. I'm, I'm sure everybody here uses QRPH. 100%? Okay. Um, it's been a dream to use QRPH in the past couple of months. And um, uh, it's super seamless. It's instant. You don't have to wait for change. You don't have to deal with uh, cash, currency, etc. And you can use any digital wallet provided by your bank. Last night, though, uh, my first ever um, um, negative experience happened while I was shopping in a supermarket called the Marketplace, which is Robinson's uh, Marketplace uh, supermarket. And I paid for it using my BPI um, wallet. I got, the conf I got the confirmation on my app. But the normal confirmation code that the sales lady or the cashier would receive on her smart or handy phone, a dumb phone, uh, feature phone, um, never arrived. So between my device, which was in Globe, um, and her device, there's so many points of failure that can happen. And being a technologist, I was already imagining which point of failure that was. Um, the first one was definitely, the, the, the simplest answer was signal. Because they were, it was passing through the Maya network, and they were using smart, uh, the smart network. Perhaps the smart network was down last night. And there were some tweets that came out that, yes, smart was having a problem. So I would have accepted that answer. The, the, it, was, uh, it, it didn't reach her, her handy phone. Her, her feature phone, and that was a point of failure. Um, but to resolve the issue, they had to muster um, the uh, store's manager to get on a regular landline to call a hotline, which wasn't answering. It took over to already 20 minutes before somebody answered. And by the time they answered, um, they had to take down a reference number that I provided, the timestamp, the, and the transaction number, et cetera, et cetera, to track, and the amount, to track down uh, some, a transaction, obviously, in their own ledger. There was a person, there were two people already involved, plus the peripheral pe people that were already, you know, um, involved in the whole situation, um, until they confirmed that, yes, it's, it was done. It, it happened, the transaction happened. They gave them manually a a uh, code, confirmation code that they could put into their POS just to just to complete the audit trail loop. Uh, but 
the funny thing was the lady, the manager of Robinson said it was their problem. Uh, their own QRPH um, um, interface. So th she couldn't understand the whole uh, thing behind it. So I said, are you sure? Um, because I don't think it's your problem. But she claimed it was her problem. Their group chats had the discussion that it was their problem. So that was that. Um, I think the big point here is, although we take our, you know, we're, it's, it's, we've, we've uh, grown by leaps and bounds during a pandemic with regards to digital payments. Um, it's true. I mean, more than 50% of payments nowadays happens um, uh, digitally. And we're so far into the future in, in terms of uh, uh, convenience with digital payments. Um, but this, this um, shows the weak points. A lot of the weak points are human, human related, because you rely on humans in, in a lot of the stages. Unfortunately, something fails, then we start, uh, we start um, um, having to have human intervention. Unfortunately also, humans are expensive. Okay. They're expensive, inefficient. And what does a digital payment uh, platform promise? It's speed, um, it's trust speed and trust and hopefully autonomy there's a there's a there's an imagined autonomy there the computers in the background just working automatically for us no? um, the distributed ledger technology promises that um, it's distributed it's trust because there has to be multiple cons there's consensus it has to be confirmed by multiple nodes in the network that establishes a trust it's supposed to be fast because of technology uh, that the implementation of the in the the consensus strategy will 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 try to optimize the uh, the speed of consensus, and then autonomy. There shouldn't be an aut um, human anymore that orchestrates the transfer of funds from one place to another. So that's the promise of uh, of DLT, um, and um, and I definitely I think we are at a point where. When in 2019, when I was still involved in in in, in blockchain, developing for the blockchain, etc., um, adoption of digital wallets wasn't very strong. Um, um, as opposed to during the pandemic, even my aircon technician who came to the house already accepted GCash. So because we didn't want to withdraw from ATMs anymore, money was dirty. There was you know it was all sanitary issues, etc. So we, we actually traversed that whole unbanked world to suddenly we have, we have so many people with, with, um, who are banked. Um, um, and we are now closer to being able to exploit DLT uh, as opposed to even three years ago, five years ago, um, which, which I think is, is uh, important to to um, to recognize because um, and vis-a-vis -vis the, the 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 initiatives of the central bank because it I hope it it um, it serves as a platform to to equalize um, our access to to cash to to fast cash to settlements fast settlements not just in the wholesale level but also on the retail level all the way to the to the even hopefully to the farmers. You know, um, um, and um, it becomes much more distributed. Um, so that said, um, all these things that you showed, those are available now on by the private sector. Gcash has access to buying cryptocurrency. You can invest. You can buy um, uh, st uh, stock market. Uh, you can buy stocks. And little by little, they're introducing all sorts of. Um, um, instruments and and services within that super app. Um, plus, add that to the to the um, initiatives of open finance, open banking, and this phenomenon called op embedded finance, um, where even applications like Grab or applications like um, you know, let's say Lazada or, or your shopping app will introduce a a sort of like disguised financial product within the within the, the app and sell you some kind of fractional insurance, for example. If you're, if you're flying and you're, you, you want to buy uh, um, a plane ticket, suddenly you have access to purchasing insurance within the app. 
by virtue of partnering with a, a third party partner. So those things are, are already real. It's easier now for adoption of, of DLT. Hopefully, as soon as if we can effectively implement that. Um, there are other issues um, that, that um, I myself have, have questions about regarding um, uh, DLT and, and public adoption of DLT because who manages the network? Is it a public network? Is it a private network? How do you pay for it? Um, if it's a public network, do you have to um, uh, purchase uh, the currency or the token uh, that's on that? Um, and um, another aspect, I wanted also to mention that uh, blockchain is not just finance uh, per se um, or, or ownership of assets. There's actually a very promising um, uh, use case for blockchain. It's uh, voting or autonomous voting. Um, imagine, for example, if you, um, for example, in the upcoming elections, you have uh, uh, senators, candidates. If each of those candidates had their own wallet address, and then on election day, every citizen had their own wallet, and they were given tokens, voting tokens. You can actually vote straight to your candidate who you want, and it's all consensus-driven, it's fast, um, it's easier, it's auditable, it's traceable, and you can count it instantaneously, and it's 24 seven. And so I, I think that's also the same uh, benefit that we have with the, with, the, with the DLT and the finance. So yeah, I should end there. Okay, thank you very much, Jay. And uh, let me now move on to our, uh, you know, very, again, I'm, I'm very glad that we have the right people who are, who are here to actually talk, talk and, and uh, uh, but uh, that said, let me now perhaps start off our discussions, other open discussions, partly by asking at least one question for each of our speakers. And um, let me start with Mr. Shetty. Uh, you know, having heard th those experiences by, by Jay and even now, the, um, uh, the use case that uh, Project Aguila, uh, um, how do you think uh, digital public infrastructure in the Philippines can be designed to specifically address needs and challenges of the emerging middle class in, in countries like the Philippines because, you know, I mean, to some extent, we are, we're all expecting things to be faster and, and, and in, in a way that's uh, pointed out by Jay, we need to trust. But sometimes still some people have this um, feelings of distrust that anything, you know, my money can get stolen or, you know, mo many other things, you know. <laughs> from And then there are also issues about, uh, from time to time, I'm sure some of you have had that kind of experience, you sending money with, on Gcash and then it doesn't, doesn't arrive. And then all of a sudden, so what's happening? And then you, you start trying to fi figure out where exactly was the fault. And then it's not just with Gcash. Sometimes it's from, the, from bank to bank, uh, you know, Try sending money, U.S. dollars from one account to another account in another bank. One bank takes three days just to <laughs> just to get the money. And uh, well, I don't know if it really does take three days, or they're using our money for somewhere else. You know, <laughs> so so that, that's why uh, again the the whole point of trust. So maybe you could give your own experiences in India to sort of uh, again provide us uh, some clues on what exactly should we be doing. <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's a, that's a very important question that you've asked. And there are two parts to that. One part of your question is uh, what kind of digital public infrastructure uh, could the Philippines leverage to empower its middle class? And then second, about trust and what happens when things go wrong, right? If, if this version of the future doesn't fully play out. Uh, so I think on the first one, uh, there are a lot of powerful ideas that come up. For example, building on the FinTinet presentation that I shared, uh, and already a lot of interesting work that's happened on interoperable QR, real-time payments uh, within the Philippines, digital ID. Um, I think if you think about, uh, for example, the capital markets use case, right? How do you democratize the retail investing? Because when you think about the middle class, and you step back, what are their needs? Their needs are, one, aspirational. So if they're aspirational, what are the types of financial products? In addition to giving them a bank account that come in, the next set of financial products are things like investing. And in the case of investing, how do you democratize that process 
both for businesses to raise capital as well as for retail investors to then participate in that economy, which otherwise is just limited to the top 1% or large hedge funds, et cetera, that have the wholesale capital to plug in, right? So I think the capital markets is a large area of development. And again, one wouldn't have to rebuild all of this infrastructure. That's sort of where the thinking behind the FinTinet came in. Second, when you think of other alternate asset classes like physical property and so on, uh, how do you allow them to be made digitally transactable? Uh, and if you can unlock that, especially small landowners, uh, small Kirana, or as we heard today, Sari Sari shops, how can they participate? How can they pledge their cash flows? so on and so forth becomes quite key. So I think that's another aspect uh, that comes in. Uh, the aspect of how do you protect people from downside, so resiliency, uh, how do you, in that context, in case of climate disasters, other types of disasters, use this infrastructure to transmit real-time benefits, vouchers uh, to citizens uh, when something happens. Uh, otherwise, many a times you're stuck with filling off paper forms and sending physical checks um, so I think you could really look at it across capital markets, insurance, um, different types of investing, alternate asset investing, uh, protecting people from downsides, uh, safekeeping of different assets. How do they have much stronger options for custody uh, and much stronger options for provenance? Because many a times we see sometimes titles will be disputed, etc. So. I think there are a lot of use cases that come out depending on the sector we talk about, uh, but really it's under the umbrella of how do you democratize that access uh, to the middle class where transaction costs become a key part. Uh, to the second part of your question, I think that's extremely important. Most of the systems we are designing today, um, as was described even by Jay, are highly multi-party in nature. And it's only going to increase as time goes by as you make systems more interoperable as you introduce more competition, you'll shift from traditional one company doing everything to multiple companies and public authorities being involved for even one transaction to go through. For example, UPI has five parties uh, involved in that one payment transaction, five parties together, right? Now in a five party system, uh, for that one payment, while that's brought in competition, choice, interoperability, you could have a failure at any one leg. And now when you're doing 500 million transactions, even a 1% failure is extremely high. That's 5 million. That's enormously high. And that's only going to increase. So how do we bake in dispute resolution? Many a times these are designed as afterthoughts because we assume things will be good, especially as technologists. You, you only think about the best case and sort of get it out. But I think there, how do you assume anything that can go wrong will go wrong? and design for those failures in mind, uh, then you start building a lot of constructs for redundancy, dispute resolution, interoperable dispute resolution, so that the individual doesn't have to run around to figure out where has it gone wrong and they're navigating between two branches. So I think that really comes from the mindset of assuming things will go wrong, and then how do you then use technology, and then some governance frameworks as well, for example, uh, dispute resolution norms, et cetera, that can plug in to address uh, when those uh, failures take place. Thank you very much. Let me now turn uh, to uh, the deputy governor. Uh, you know, I mean, I, I think Mr. Shetty pointed out earlier that you might have this, you know, you try to build roads and, and the roads won't be interlocking with each other because, you know, so I can imagine that uh, when you're when you are thinking along the lines of Project Avila and 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 and, and thinking of a uh, you know the Philippine CBDC. Uh, how you you really like to complement and transform the existing digital payment systems, but there's also a possibility that uh, you know when you have competition, a, com a competing system, then again things may go wrong. Uh, I, I I mean I'm glad that you're thinking first of a sandbox approach, but as we you try to then explain and communicate all of those key learnings from the sandbox, from the case, the proof of case, uh, I, how do you build the, the trust? Um, you know, I, I, I guess it's probably something that you, you're, it's still work in progress, but maybe you'd like to gi uh, give some clues on, on what the, the BSB is, is sort of thinking along the lines. 
Um, yes, uh, the first uh, part of your question, Dr. Uh, Toots, is uh, um, how do we make sure that uh, uh, there is competition while, of course, making the service available and, and affordable to, to the target market? Um, we do that by, uh, we, we, first of all, let me start with, we believe in uh, competition and the benefits that it brings. So it drives efficiency, it drives choice, and uh, it drives innovation. Uh, but then uh, we don't want to end up in a state where, like in Siddharth's diagram, uh, for me to go from Makati to BGC, there are 40 roads as there are 40 banks. I mean, I mean, you know. So it, it the some some um, inter interoperability has really to be assured, so that there's no duplication, there is efficiency, drives down costs. And we one of the ways we do that is by uh, setting standards, like Jay mentioned about the QRPH. You know, before uh, each bank was coming up with their own QR. And the consequence of that is if you are bank A and the merchant uses bank B, then you cannot transact. Uh, so we standardized the QR. We said there only has to be one national standard for QR, which now is the QRPH. So that, again, the banks can compete for your, I mean, uh, to, to uh, open accounts for you. But once you have an account, you should be able to pay uh, anyone using the same uh, QR. So that, that is, it, that's an example of, of how we uh, ensure uh, interoperability and also uh, driving efficiency in, in the payment system. Now, like to uh, Jay's point, uh, there are indeed, uh, there may be points, uh, various points of failure that in, in the particular story, it could be that the SMS, because he made mention of a feature phone. <laughs> so I imagine the sales lady was waiting for the SMS notification uh, when actually the value, the payment was actually consummated, was, was completed, except that the sales lady, because of maybe uh, inadequate signal, um, didn't receive the SMS notification. That's why when they verified with their bank, uh, they saw that the payment was indeed received and therefore uh, too bad it took Jay like more than 20 minutes. No? Uh, that's, that's, uh, these are the uh, 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 scenarios that, uh, to Siddharth's point, uh, we have to uh, go through uh, possible points of failure and, and determine how best to recover uh, from those uh, failures. I'm just thinking, uh, Jay's story, if it's just the SMS that wasn't received, perhaps there's a a functionality that lets the sales lady review the last, I don't know, 10 transactions. And then if Jay says, oh, that's the, my payment, see, we have matching reference number, then, then that, that should settle it. Next, um, that's great uh, with the assumption that both payer and payee always agree. But there are cases when the payer and the payee don't agree. So we need to have a recourse mechanism. Uh, we issued a circular, I forget the number, but anyway, this is a circular, it's a regulation on uh, consumer redress standards, meaning uh, this takes effect in January 1 of next year. So right now, if uh, just in case, I, although the failure rates are very, very low, but just in case I sent an InstaPay to Jay, and uh, for some reason, Jay calls me and says, uh, Mert, I did not receive your, your payment. And uh, right now, well, it's, it's an open secret. I don't have to protect it. Uh, uh, either Jay calls his bank or I call my bank. And most likely, they both don't know what happened. And so I ask them, okay, when? When will this be resolved? Question mark. No standard. Uh, you see, we will have to work with the switch. We'll see whether the transaction, well, 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 like that. <laughs> so, um, so we now said, okay, 
you have to do something such that for failed credits, if, if my payment did not, was not received, you have to return my money within an hour. So you do all things you need to do, but beyond one hour, customer can claim already. So it's your obligation now. So uh, there, fortunately, there's a way. There's a use of technology by standardizing our messages. No? Right now, the global standard is ISO 222. We are, impo we are now, well, I wouldn't like to say imposed, but we have convinced uh, and uh, obtained the cooperation of the industry to all of us to be on this standard so that uh, the bank system would already know the answer if Jay's bank received my cr credit instruction and if his bank already credited the funds to his account. So uh, if, if my bank does not receive that confirmation, they should immediately and without any human intervention uh, reverse that transaction and, re and return the funds out of the failed credits uh, to me. Kasi ano yan eh, when I send an Instapay or Pesa, syempre, debit my account first, di ba? Then, then we uh, settle. The main difference is that Instapay settles, no, no, Instapay makes the funds immediately available, while PesaNet makes it like two hours uh, later, no? So, um, um, and of course, we have strengthened the financial consumer protection. We have not, last year, uh, the Congress enacted the law, the Financial Consumer Protection Act, uh, that now allows BSP to adjudicate cases, um, disagreements between the, the, the financial consumer and the financial provider. So, whereas before, it will take you, you would have to resort to the courts to resolve this. Now it's very, it's happening very fast because it's just within BSP because we were given that power to adjudicate uh, these cases. Of course, if you're not happy with adjudication, you, the next step is you go to the Court of Appeals. But uh, so that's 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 the that's the what we have now. So it's both, and also we're strengthening our fraud prevention uh, mechanism. We're working on um, projects that make use of data analytics, so that uh, we could the system can inform the financial institutions on possible risks about this uh, transaction, either with the transaction or with the parties involved. So um, these measures, plus of course the recourse mechanisms, um, should help uh, further increase the trust you know, in, in, in our digital payment uh, system. Of course, we're not overlooking the potential of retail CBDC there. You know? uh, but then, um, you know, s sometimes we need to prioritize things where the we utilize resources on where they can create the most impact uh, in 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 you know in the short, medium, and long term. So we will, we will, I, I don't know. Who knows? Uh, one day uh, we'll have retail CBDC too. Retail CBDC is something that you can use, not just the bank. Yeah. Okay. So we will look forward to that day, hopefully. Um, so let me turn to. To Mr. Fajardo, um, so what uh, obstacles do you see for startups that are trying to integrate with all of these larger BPI initiatives? And how do you think all of these obstacles, barriers, and bottlenecks can actually be overcome? Um, well, startups obviously have um, different vertical initiatives that they do. So you, you, you've got FinTech, you've got Health Tech, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and when you say DPI, that, that runs the gamut of all these, not just FinTech. Um, it's, I, I personally experienced that uh, Central Bank has been one of the most progressive uh, agencies to support um, development on the FinTech side. They, they really 
um, provided that sandbox. They invited people to join it. Um, they've got some very progressive uh, people on board to, to, to try to guide it and try to build policy out of that. So that's something that was super welcome. And I think that's also one of the major um, reasons why we were successful in rolling out all these digital finance products. So I think that's the one of the least of our problems for, for startup. No? It's semi-mature already. Um, on the healthcare side, health tech side, that uh, includes a lot of privacy issues. And um, but there are frameworks that we can follow, obviously, like HIPAA from the United States, um, etc. And this became the the need for for um, for good frameworks actually became very apparent during the pandemic, when social distancing required us to obviously to 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 inhibit or limit our our mobility, and the Department of Health immediately issued a circular allowing for digital prescriptions to be accepted by pharmacies. So just just to just to, to reduce the the human mobility friction um, um, phenomenon, and that was uh, that was super welcome. Now, um, 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 despite that, there are a lot of other policy issues still that. Um, that are are present that are block roadblocks for startups to to move faster, innovate faster. A lot of it is very fundamental, and a lot of it is is uh, sometimes even ridiculous, um, um, because they're, they're they're you know not that's the nature of government. They're not they're not fast enough to 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 uh, adapt to the speed of or the velocity of startups or innovation. But um, um, the, the, the government has actually initiated, at least on the enabling side, um, leg legislation such as the Innovative Startup Act. But that's super broad. It's, it, it, um, it covers a lot of Capacity building, um, finance, in incentives, some some basic um, investments, a startup venture fund, startup grant fund from from the DOST um, and uh, DICT, um, but there are no tactical uh, policies in place on the national level to help to help uh, startups coming out of our space. There are though um, in the LGUs. So you have to rely now on on uh, forward-looking um, LGU leaders to create their own uh, policies on the ground level, which is super useful. And I think in our country, uh, being an archipelago and being very diverse, I think it's much more effective because we're we're actually addressing um, very very nuanced, very distinct cultures in our locales. So so that that's definitely welcome. But there's still a lot. Uh, a lot um, of work to do. Uh, we've only seen one LGU so far that's super, super proactive uh, um, in the ordinance level. The others are very high-level concepts and all that. But um, th those are, those are uh, things we're looking forward to. Now, um, one of the things that we'd like to see, for example, we've got LGUs that are already digital. Um, you can already register for your business. You can receive your business permits uh, as a PDF, etc. Um, we still want. There's still apprehension. There's still apprehension about openly providing that to us, to the startup community, so that we can tap into it and create our own layer of applications on top of that. Um, it could be uh, distrust or or fear. Um, of fraud. I mean, everybody knows that we've been hacked multiple times already. Here, these are government websites, and that doesn't really bode well for trust. But um, I, th since we're there already, there has to be that leap uh, towards bringing the public sector or private sector into the into the into the um, digital infrastructure that the government has provided. On the other side of things, also. Is the um, um, the open gov and open data 
uh, program before, which which have which I think up to 2015 or 2016 we still had that, but uh, suddenly it stopped. That could have helped uh, startups that were let's say health tech startups that could have taken advantage of DOH data or field health data to create new um, innovative products. Now that AI is here. Um, um, it would have been very useful to have access to um, uh, dengue outbreak information and all that so that we could actually uh, craft new new products to address and to predict maybe in the future so that that's a that's a very clear example um, just you know it, it's sad that there was a time when even though open gov was already trying to be pushed um, the archiving system of many government agencies was taking digital data, which is already in digital data, which is Excel, and exporting it to a PDF and putting that PDF into a CD-ROM. So it, it's, 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 it's a little bit uh, strange, but it's good that we have AI now because now you can take those PDFs and send them, feed them back into AI so that they can extract the data points. Good thing. Uh, <laughs> um, on the side of AI, uh, since we're talking about uh, policy, um, we're a lot of us are more are 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 over concerned about ethics prematurely, especially in the Philippines, when other countries are already uh, their national AI uh, roadmap includes setting up compute power. Like Hong Kong is setting up their supercomputer center in the Hong Kong Science and Technology Park. Uh, Singapore is also building their 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 infra on the compute power because AI is not cheap, and they're also focused on bu building their own large language models. Like uh, so, they're not dependent on open AI in the states or or Mistral or or uh, or what have you. Um, so Singapore is doing that, creating a national LL LLM. Same with um, Hong Kong. Meanwhile, us, we're still talking about um, um, pol ethics, policies. None of that is being discussed. And that's actually sort of like uh, um, national IP, national intellectual property that we should create. Um, it's expensive, though. Um, our drawback is that we're, we have expensive power, um, and chips are getting more expensive by the day. Um, if you're familiar with Andreessen Horowitz, this is a VC firm out of the United States. They actually visited Taiwan to buy up chips and create their own data centers so that they could serve their portfolio startups that they've invested in. Because they see that coming, the, the, the shortage of compute power. So those are things that we should actually start thinking about. Um, otherwise, we'd be left behind with regards to developing our own capabilities on the AI front. Um, it's already policy level in, in these countries, nationally, so uh, we should uh, perhaps work on that as well. Okay, so now we are going to take some questions from the floor. Uh, yes, Marilyn, uh, well, of course I know you, but uh, uh, could you introduce yourself and uh, the institution that you represent? Thank you. If only they were able to do this, you know, using this or counter or anything, it would have been much, much easier for us to have saved the country by now. Number two, you talked about regulation. Regulation, for example, the DOH up to now requires us, clinics and hospitals, to copy manually from a computerized process, the results of blood sample. We have a lot of patients, and we have to c 
ਰਾਤੀ ਦੋਸਤੋ ਇਹ ਤੋਂ ਅੱਲਾ ਹੋ ਮਾਨ ਮਾਨੀ ਹੋ ਕੇ ਰਹੋ ਐਸ ਐਸ ਬੰਦ ਸੇ ਆਪ ਸਭ ਕੋ ਕੀਤੇ ਪ੍ਰਿੰਟ ਆਊਟ ਬੀ ਯੂ نو ਇਸ਼ੂਡ ਬਾਈ ਦਾ ਕੰਪਲੀਟ ਬਾਈ ਦਾ ਮਸ਼ੀਨ ਦਟ ਟੈਸਟ ਦਾ ਪਲਾਰ ਪੀਸੀ ਕੋਰੀ ਸੇ ਸੈਡ ਇਸ ਸੈਡ ਯੂ ਇਸ ਪਾਲਿਸੀ ਯੂ نو ਵੀ ਕੰਪਲੀਟਡ ਦਾ ਵਰਕ ਟਾਈਮ ਐਂਡ ਦਾ ਕੋਸਟ in a spirit minute it would cost us like 6 million pesos a year wait so you know besides to the a lot of you know big little things seemingly but really the bigger picture we have to see that the entire I and mean, the entire bill is itself for me mm. does not have a it does not have that uh, digital or connectedness thinking imagine us going to print out how many times did we try to make sure that our our systems are interoperable should be shouldn't be mm. we have our own private things but we have to have put the several things to make us interoperable mm-hmm. okay mm. so thank thank you for that reaction but you you want someone specifically and the, the to maybe maybe we can ask first ask mr shetty if if there might be some kinds of experiences in india that that might be also helpful for us to think about sure so uh, the two parts I, i did spend quite a bit of time in india building digital infrastructure and health and then move back to finance because it's because it's really really difficult um i think one construct is the what we found powerful to your first point of you know any one particular agency being resistant to share data back with a company we see this pattern across the board across countries across sectors uh, it's a very common pattern and so one thing we've been looking at quite deeply is how do you create a construct where any company any government agency uh, anyone can give data back to the individual that's something people are a lot more comfortable with natively then if a startup has to partner with a hospital or a startup has to partner with a financial institution it becomes a bit harder i'm not saying it can't be done it does become harder and in some sectors it's much harder like you mentioned in health but no one can dispute the fact that my data should be given back to me along with some other metadata i as an individual can create now my digital file and then give it back to the startup if it's giving me a second opinion versus you know trying to negotiate on common terms uh, what are the liability frameworks if i give data as a hospital to you as a startup what will happen if there's a breach etc so i think just as a mental model i can't answer your question directly we've been thinking a lot about how do you create technology tools that give data back to individuals and then they can authorize they can consent they can permission for that data to be shared with any startup in any sector anywhere else in the world um to the to the second part of of the question around uh, healthcare and and digital infrastructure in healthcare i think one of the challenges in healthcare is really the fragmentation because you have a lot of also small providers within the banking system at least it's relatively a larger number of institutions that may have larger it budgets in healthcare you'll have small you know clinics so on and so forth that that does make it harder uh but i think there are a lot of use cases in healthcare like claims insurance how do you move have those auto adjudicated uh, how do we move broadly i think one of the things we were looking at in india is uh, today one of the biggest disease burdens across the world is um uh, y- you've moved away from dealing with infectious diseases towards now managing non communicable diseases right obesity diabetes etc but our entire care system is designed to ca- take care of very transaction specific infectious diseases so now how do you design a system which is where technology comes in for continuity of care and i think that requires a lot of rethink within our public health systems of how do you allow for that continuum to be provided uh, which are, otherwise you just went in for a particular infection and came out when that was resolved so i don't know if it answered the question but just some thoughts on that for id yeah i 
A gap? Yeah, you mean by gender? Yeah, yeah. yeah. We have, um, so on the ID side, 1.4 billion Indians uh, have a digital ID, uh, B, with uh, letter B. Uh, in that situation, uh, there have been quite a few studies done by, uh, I think this was the Findex of the World Bank and others, that show that because we gave individuals their digital ID, individuals across the board, under 18, over 18, men, women, everyone has it, transgenders, everyone has it, it's highly inclusive, we have bridged both the youth gap, because traditionally bank accounts were held by older men, and the gender gap, in addition to, of course, coverage. Um, so there is data available on uh, digital ID. There is some data available on digital payments. A lot of it is anecdotal, but basically what would happen is a lot of women in rural areas uh, would delete, they would not manage their finances themselves. Because if they had to manage it, they would have to travel, you know, many kilometers to a bank branch, and you know, you'll have different social issues that play out in that process. And as a result, they would delegate it. They would take a card and give it to some boy in the village and say, go run to the bank branch, take money out. So that was a loss of agency for them. Now, with them having a smartphone, you could deliver financial services to them. That became a lot more empowering. So there are anecdotal parts like that, but in some cases there is data, a lot of it is public data that's available on this disaggregation. Question? Oh, oh yes. Yeah, just to uh, add briefly, uh, you know, um, 15 years ago when I started my uh, uh, policy work, uh, we ran always into these kinds of things because uh, I realized now that uh, the the understanding of innovation and the, and the mindset to deal with it is asymmetric, meaning some are you know uh, ahead on the, in health, ahead in finance, but some lag. And so, normally, when you now think of an end-to-end -end transaction, you try to think it through, and now you see barriers. Uh, for example, when, when we were thinking of uh, how to uh, have more businesses use digital payments, because right now, checks, uh, supplier payments, is predominant. So why is that? And then upon investigation, we see that uh, uh, the, the corporates prefer checks because, number one, uh, when they pay the check, the, I instantaneously they get the receipt. Oh, why buy a receipt? Because the receipt is required by the revenue authority to claim uh, expenses, to document your uh, expenses. So it's things like this. So one, one policymaker is moving fast on one side, and then we'll get into a roadblock uh, when, 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 you know, try to uh, solve it uh, end to end. Uh, so, I think I think that's, I mean that's that's everywhere. Uh, it's just because of you know the understanding, the literacy, the literacy in innovation is asymmetric, and so uh, one way we use to overcome that is uh, of course convince the top, because you know when you talk to the middle, you get a lot of barriers. You got a lot of competing interests and agenda, so it's, it's so difficult. So uh, talk to the main decision uh, maker and have it try to have it uh, driven top down. But to do so, and this I think you can play a very large role in this, w as as those among us who is aiding policy work, I, I reckon that's one of the works of uh, PIDs. We, we need to put together a, a um, comprehensive but easily understandable framing of the problem statement. You know, our usual work, right? The problem statement that we... And then make, make the top guy uh, understand and then substantiating this with uh, actual uh, data. Sometimes when we talk to mayors, when, when they find out that the... If there's a large percentage of this problem happening in this area, then then they they begin to believe that it's a real it's a real problem that I need to address, uh, and so it, you 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 get attention and you get uh, you know the commitment of of uh, those leaders. So I think PIDs as an institution um, 
that's your expertise, you know, uh, framing this uh, uh, um, problem, providing the data, analyzing root causes, pushing for solutions to address the root causes. I, I think these are, we, we can work together on, 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 on this. No? Okay, yeah, sure, sure, uh, Jay. So yeah, I wanna, I wanna address the same um, issue about that, uh, having to use a logbook. Um, because first of all, it's a national level policy flaw which affects everybody, all of us. It trickles down to all of us because if it's a problem with um, the hospital, uh, all hospitals, it, it's a all everybody's problem. Efficient, it hits us, the efficiency flaw. Um, and it sounds like it's a problem that could have been solved 20 years ago. Maybe more. Maybe more. <laughs> uh, like accept the digital data as, as, a, as a authoritative information. Um, and I agree that maybe this is the venue, hopefully, that everybody's taking notes and a report is coming out or a white paper that's going to be presented to someone who in charge who can who will finally see it because it looks like it's not no one knows that this is a problem mm. or this is, it's just accepted on that level and it's not going to the higher ups so how does that how do we make that happen now do we solve, do we do we write about it is it a private sector's job is it um, uh, who do we write who do we who do we call yeah so that that's a good point that the ideas really should be doing something a little bit more, but at the same time, we've been doing try. Well, the, we're not a lot of us in PIDS. We don't even have a budget for our, for next year's. Uh, uh, we are supposed to having to be constructing our building at, at UP, but no budget in the NEP, by the way. <laughs> that, uh, just an insertion uh, that we're not we're not unfortunately uh, in the mindset of many of our decision makers. But that said. Uh, how maybe there might be just one extra question that uh, yes please. Oh, thank you very much. I'm Ase Claude Santos from the uh, Department of uh, Social Welfare and Development. Looking at the session topic, harnessing data in innovation in public systems, it really uh, excites me in the possibilities of improving the provision of of, of uh, governance services, as uh, of course directed by our president that uh, government agencies uh, should digitalize the provision of our services. And in DSWD, we often work with other government agencies as well, as we, uh, of course, tackle or serve the same clients. And uh, one particular client, uh, which is, of course, seeking assistance from the DSWD uh, regarding their medical or hospitalization bill, they need to go to us, comply with the requirements of providing the medical abstract, the hospital billing. So with this uh, innovation or improvement in technology, I'm wondering how would the national government really move uh, forward, ensuring that we provide more ease of access, convenience to the clients, that we no longer require redundant documentation to, to be presented considering that these are already emanating from a, a government agency as well, and it should be legitimate, and it can also provide the basis for the amount of assistance that uh, should be given. Another concern, of course, is uh, our regulatory agencies as well. The commission and audit always prefer wet signature and paper documentation on this uh, transaction. So I think that is a quite challenging for the Philippine government. Perhaps uh, PEDS and the uh, honorable speakers may uh, come up with the, a better solution so that in the end, one, we are able to achieve the integration of our uh, database mm -hmm. as well as ensure that uh, we streamline further the, uh, the processes and documentations required to make it more easier for our clients to be served anywhere because this is the same person availing services from one or more government agency. Why don't we make their lives easier 
by getting our acts together. Thank you very much. Well, thank you very much, Hasek Rod. The only thing is sometimes, unfortunately, we instead of making things easier, we make it things much more difficult. It, it seems that that's the, the, <laughs> the tendency in, in government. Uh, uh, much as I'd like to give time, I was actually warned that we're, we're already a little bit off time, but um, we do have food outside. Uh, <laughs> that's the first thing before you actually go for the plenary, but maybe I could invite uh, just uh, all our speakers, uh, starting with, with Jay and then we, with, the, with the deputy governor and then with the, with the main speaker, to give maybe just a, a minute or so to, to final words. Jay? So, yeah, I'll take this uh, opportunity to answer that question. Um, I won't name companies yet because it's still yet to be announced, but I'll name the agency, Feel Health. And um, there is a company that's about to launch in Field Health, this AI initiative, on both sides. Turns out, Field Health, when you file your, your Field Health, Field Health claim as a hospital, um, you have to make sure that your, your information on the form is 100% accurate, otherwise it gets rejected. And you have to wait another 60 days out of the first 120 days uh, for settlement. Um, so this company is using AI to make sure it reviews the claims form and tells you whether or not this is going to get rejected. So that's happening on one side. So feel that ask, ask them also to work on the claim side itself, the vetting. Um, turns out there's a 350,000 claims backlog and there are only 400 people trying to get, go through all those claims. That's why, you know, you see in the news a lot of, uh, unpaid hospitals, right? Uh, so they're about to implement um, AI on that side to vet the claims already, to speed that up. And what used to take, uh, what, to vet it, maybe uh, 40, 60 minutes, brought, brought it down to about 5 to 15 minutes of vetting, just to, and it's automated already. So, so there's promise in that. If they can do it there, they can do it to the SWD. You can already imagine the use case, right? Um, and then your second question was on the e-signatures and all these other things that have not been adopted. Cool. Yeah, exactly. There's a lot of um, there's a lot of platforms already that uh, that exist where you can you can you can route documents, and it's going to be a dream. For example, with SEC when you when you file your articles of incorporation, because instead of sending it to all the incorporators for a wet signature, you just do it digitally. But there's that thing that 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 fear. Yeah, the fear of of uh, being being um, accused of fraud. So they they like to to cover all their bases, and unfortunately, that's the result. So. Uh, sorry. Uh, I if not next week announcement, week after next. Yeah. Okay. The pilot, huh? Yeah, the pilot. The pilot. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> all right, the deputy governor. Uh, your last. Uh... Yeah, thank you for uh, inviting me here. But I, I guess it's a good opportunity to deliver uh, a message that, um, especially for topics where the BST has mandate over. Personally, I have mandate over uh, digital payments and currency. Perhaps uh, we can work together on, uh, let's say, influencing uh, government decision makers on. Uh, just just thinking about uh, things in a different in a different way I'll give an example uh, my particular concern is a uh, you know uh, government uh, of course it's, it's, it's the large largest uh, uh, purchaser in the market okay so uh, and and uh, when it comes to for example collecting non-tax revenues uh, the the Right now, the most common way that the government would do it is uh, each agency would now contract with uh, whoever, whichever provider. And then um, f for the fee, of course, the provider will not render it for free. Uh, what, whatever the fee is, it passes it on to the consumers. Of course, that addresses uh, a segment of the population that recognizes the value of not having to go to the city hall or government agency in order to uh, perform their uh, transaction. No? Uh, but the larger part looks at that as a friction and would rather go there to you know, transact personally 
uh, and all that. So uh, when the uh, proposal to uh, say that uh, have have government paid the fee, so it's free to the citizens, and there's no no longer friction for you know paying uh, digitally, and, and that has a very catalytic effect because once the public gets used to that, then they will trust now paying uh, alcohol, water, insurance, everything. Uh, also uh, similarly. So, uh, but then the question on, uh, yeah, but uh, you see uh, there's a fee and then the government has to pay it, we need to budget like that. But then again, if you look at it from another side where there is a compensating benefit, like, okay, you, government, you pay for digital and you can reduce the number of teller windows in your agency, uh, the, 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 you have a net gain. So um, I think framing this um, in a convincing way to uh, the government decision makers can help us a lot. Uh, because what we're advocating is that for government, not only for government, you, you go to SM, uh, you buy a thing, you buy a merchandise. Do you pay? No. You don't pay. It's the SM that pays for the bank for that, for that uh, collection uh, or acceptance service, right? So it, it similarly, and you ask SM, well, that's that's a million times preferred than having to deploy uh, two thousand sales ladies there to process checkout uh, transactions. No, they, they can see the value. But um, if you could help us also. <laughs> <laughs> convince government of the value of digitalizing this. Okay, there's a cost, but th there's a net gain because you have you you can now uh, reduce processing times. You know, cashier accepts money, writes on paper that goes to another staff, uh, encodes the the you know you know you know the the story. Um, data is transformed, and you you need people to to do that. So. Um, again, if we could convince policy, the decision makers that there is a net gain to government for this, then I, I think it will, uh, it's just an example, but my main, main message is if you have these uh, problem statements that would be directly under, um, let's say, BSP's mandate, I cannot speak for my peers, but me, I'm, I'm interested to, you know, uh, sit down with um, if the building is the problem, I can provide you space. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so that's nice to hear. <laughs> yeah. So let's see how we can work together. So okay, okay. Thank you, Deputy Governor. Mr. Shetty, your last word. Thank you so much, and and thank you to Pids for uh, putting this together. Uh, one briefly to touch upon the question that you asked. I think it's extremely important whenever you're effecting change through public policy, that this change is going to take time. I mean, if you look at our own experiences in digital payments, you would remember we started off with cash and people, you know, 20, 30 years back would not trust doing any transaction using cards online. Then that sort of shifted. You started to trust cards, electronic cards, uh, but you would always want a paper receipt because we were not sure if that transaction went through. So, you know, people would create physical copies of that, and you'd store those receipts. And then as newer generations came on, they said, I don't need a paper receipt. Maybe just an SMS or message sent to me is good enough. And newer generations just say, I scanned the QR. I digitally got a yes. That's it. I'll walk out. I don't need any other receipt from you. So we have to realize that across society, people would be at different levels of fear, and that affects adoption, adoption in different sectors. And so it's extremely important that we stay perseverant as we're affecting this change because it just inherently takes time. And, and you know, some communities might be further along uh, than others, but that's generally what we see uh, with any new technology coming in. And, and lastly, I would add, if any of you are working in any of the areas that uh, I shared in my presentation about the FinTinet, again, it's not just about finance. It's people working on areas in healthcare, agriculture, commerce, uh, because a lot of them require very similar building blocks of, of digital ways of uh, enforcing and thinking about trust. Uh, please do reach out 
uh, there's a large global community and we'd love to have your expertise in, in helping shape that. Thank you. Yes, yes, yes. All right, so thank you very much. We, we, let me, now let me just end the session and I invite everybody to take your snacks before proceeding up for, uh, down, sorry. But we could we'd like to first have a photo yeah, for the speakers and myself.